John is going to teach us how to overcome the world. And I've entitled this morning's message, Overcoming 101. 1 John chapter 5, verses 1 through 5. Verse 1. Everyone who believes that Jesus is the Christ has been born of God. And everyone who loves the Father loves whoever has been born of Him. By this we know that we love the children of God when we love God and obey His commandments. For this is the love of God, that we keep His commandments, and His commandments are not burdensome. For everyone who has been born of God overcomes the world. And this is the victory that has overcome the world, our faith. Who is it that overcomes the world except the one who believes that Jesus is the Son of God? Here in this text, John gives us a crash course on how to overcome the world. And he says there plainly in verse 4 how to overcome the world. And it's through our faith that we are able to overcome this world. Now what does it mean exactly to overcome the world? And how does your faith overcome it. That's what I'd like to spend this morning unpacking, those two questions. And I'd like to actually answer the first question right now. And throughout the course of this message, I want to allow the Apostle John to answer that second question. Namely, what kind or how does your faith overcome this present world? But first off, what does it even mean to overcome this world? What it means, quite simply, is that you are not defeated by the world's hostility. And you also are not tempted by the world's temptations to leave and forsake Christ for all the things that it loves. So you don't get defeated by its persecution. You're not defeated by its hostility. You're not defeated by its hatred of your Lord. And you also don't fall prey into following the world into all of its deceitful desires and temptations that allure us into sin. So you do not quit on Christ. And you also are not tempted to altogether turn away from Christ. That's what it means to overcome the world. So then, if that's what it means to overcome the world, what kind of faith overcomes this world? What kind of faith do you have to have if you are to be a conqueror in Christ? Well, here in verses 1 through 5, John gives us three ingredients of an overcoming faith. If you possess these three key ingredients in your faith, you will be an overcomer <coughs> through Jesus Christ. So what are these three ingredients then? Let's take them one at a time. Ingredient number one for overcoming the world is Christian faith. We see this in verse 1a, the first half of verse 1. Look at it with me, please. Everyone who believes that Jesus, notice this, is the Christ, has been born of God. You have to acknowledge something about Christ in order to be saved. He can't just be some amorphous figure who existed in history and time and space. You have to acknowledge him as the anointed of God. That's what Christ means. It, it, it's, it's the Greek carryover from the Hebrew word Messiah, Messiah. And it means to be anointed. Jesus Christ was the anointed of God because he was the anointed prophet and priest and king. The kinds of figures that were anointed to carry out their specific tasks in the Old Testament. Jesus was all three of those things. And he was sent by God. To free his people, not from a political setting, not to give them some sort of military liberation, but to give them freedom from sin. The reason the Son of God came into the world, John said earlier on, was to destroy the works of the devil. To redeem his people from their sin. That's why Jesus was anointed by his Father and sent to this earth. Was to rescue you and me from our sins. You can't merely blindly believe that Jesus existed. Roman historians have done that. You must confess him as the Christ. 
Thomas Watson, a great 17th century Puritan, he says this about knowing something about God before he believed in him. He says, Antecedent to faith is knowledge. Faith is an intelligent grace. That's quite the phrase there. Our faith is not just you putting your, your, your mind on the side and altogether throwing off reason and rationality when you come to God. No. Faith is an intelligent grace from God. Though there can be knowledge without faith, Watson continues, yet there can be no faith without knowledge. Knowledge must carry the torch before faith. Before faith be wrought, God shines in with a light upon the understanding. A blind faith is as bad as a dead faith. That eye may as well be said to be a good eye which is without sight, as that faith is good which is without knowledge. Devout ignorance damns. Close quote. Do you acknowledge Jesus as the Christ? The anointed one of God. Like Peter did in his Caesarea Philippi confession. Do you remember that instance in the Gospels? When Jesus turns to the disciples and he says, Who do you say that I am? What does Peter say in reply? He says, You are the Christ. The Son of the living God. And Jesus answered him. Notice what Jesus says in response to this confession. Just in case Peter is tempted to pat himself on the back and say, I thought of that and I realized that myself. Jesus puts Peter right in his place. Jesus answered Peter, Blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you. But my Father, who is in heaven, in the words of Thomas Watson, there was a light that shone upon Peter's understanding. That's the only way anyone can know Christ. Is if God sovereignly shines a light upon our dead understandings of Him. And He reveals Christ in us to be the Son of God as He truly is. Failure to acknowledge Jesus as the Christ, John says, throughout his letter, is to be not a liar, but the liar. You're rejecting Christ as He has revealed Himself to be. Notice this stern word from John in 1 John chapter 2, verse 22. Who is the liar, but he who denies that Jesus is the Christ? This is the Antichrist. He who denies the Father and the Son. Beloved, the Antichrist does not just have a pitchfork and horns on his head. The Antichrist is anyone who denies Jesus for who he claimed to be. That person could be sitting next to you in your cubicle. That is the spirit of the Antichrist. And the only way that we can recognize Jesus for who he was is if we are born of God, the text says. Look at this. Everyone who believes that Jesus is the Christ has been born of God, has been made a spiritual offspring of God. This is a past act with continuing effects in the present. Did you notice how it said, you have been born of God, if you acknowledge Jesus as the Christ? Those tenses are important. I want you to hear this comment from John Stott on this text. He says, The combination of the present tense, believes, and the perfect tense, has been born, is important. It shows clearly that believing is the consequence, not the cause, of the new birth. Believing is the consequence, not the cause of the new birth. Our present continuing activity of believing is the result and therefore the evidence of our past experience of new birth by which we became and remain God's children. What Stott is saying is quite simply this. Regeneration precedes In other words, God must cause you to be born again, sovereignly, before you trust in Jesus as the Christ. You are completely passive in that act. 
as the Westminster Confession says. Is that offensive to our modern sensibilities? The fact that we didn't free will ourselves into the kingdom of God, but that God, out of the freeness of his will, decided to bestow salvation upon dead sinners like you and me. The one who believes that Jesus is the Christ has been born of God because God has made them born again, and now you believe that Jesus is the Christ. You don't believe in the Christ, believe that Jesus is Christ, and then are caused to be born again. It's the other way around. That is a distinctive of the Reformed faith. If you start to say that in modern evangelical circles, you will get looked at funny. But I think it's what the Bible clearly teaches. I think you have to be asleep at the spiritual wheel, in other words, to miss this. Look even what, what John says about these things. In 1 John, he says, chapter 2, verse 29, Everyone who practices righteousness has been born of him. Practice righteousness? It's because regeneration has been given to you in the past. 1 John 3 9. He, the believer, cannot keep on sinning. You cannot remain in a state of unrepentant belief where you don't care about your sin any longer. That is categorically untrue of the Christian. You love righteousness and you hate your sin. And in that sense, you don't keep on sinning desirously says, he cannot keep on sinning because he has been born of God. 1 John 4, 7. Whoever loves has been born of God and knows God. Is this offensive to you or does it cause you to fall on your face and worship before God? I think the key statement on this is in John's gospel, actually. John 1, verses 12 through 13. But to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. Amen and amen. You receive him, you believe in him, you're a child of God. But John keeps going. Who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. That's John's way of saying you did not free will yourself into the kingdom of God. Close quote. Ingredient number one of an overcoming faith is a born-again, Messiah-embracing Christian faith. That overcomes the world. Ingredient number two, the kind of faith that overcomes the world, is a loving faith. We see that in the second half of verse 1 all the way through verse 3. Look at the second half of verse 1 with me. And everyone who loves the Father loves whoever has been born of Him. You now have a love for the children of God because you yourself are a child of God. Everyone who loves their father should love their father's children. In an ideal world. What is true of the human family is also true of the divine society. If you love the begetter, you love the begotten. Do you love the other brothers and sisters in your spiritual family? Yes, even that person. You notice the all-encompassing nature of John's statement there? Everyone who loves the Father loves whoever has been born of Him. He states it as a fact. Of course, it's a command to love because we're still sinners and we need exhortations in that direction. But it's a statement of fact. Your disposition towards the children of God is to love them. To lay down your life for that person who you might not agree with who's sitting across from you in the pew. You love whoever is born of God. And if you're tempted to say in your heart of hearts, well, I love all Christians except that one Christian. I want you to consider Jesus' words in Matthew chapter 18, verse 10. See that you do not despise one of these little ones, one of his children, not even one of them. For I tell you, That in heaven, their angels always see the face of my Father who is in heaven. 
their angels in heaven, however many there are. <laughs> I'm not going to say everybody just has a guardian angel. But Jesus does say that the heavenly ditch dispatches are ready to be sent out on behalf of the children of God. Therefore, watch how, how you treat them. The heavenly host, they are ready to do their father's bidding when they are assailed and attacked. Angels are ministering spirits sent out to serve for the sake of those who are to inherit salvation, Hebrews 1 tells us. You better not offend one of those little ones. God watches out for them. As C.S. Lewis says, there is joy enough in the little finger of a saint to waken all the dead things of the universe into life. There's enough joy in the finger of that one saint that you can't stand to, as C.S. Lewis says, to, to awaken the entire universe into life. Love those even more hard to love. Well, how do you know if your love for others is legit? How can I tell if my love is pure and genuine and unadulterated on their behalf? Well, look with me at verse 2. By this, we know that we love the children of God. When we love God and obey His commandments. It's a very strange response, in my estimation, from John. How do you know you love the children of God when you keep God's commandments? <laughs> it's weird. I feel like he would say, how do you know you love the children of God? Well, you agree with them. You serve them. You lay down your life for them. You do whatever it takes to bless them. But he simply says, when we love God and obey His commandments, that's how you know. You love the children of God. What John is saying here is this. How do you know you love the children of God? If your primary concern in your relationships is obedience to God. That's how you know you're loving the children of God rightly. To state it differently, to love the children of God well doesn't mean you cuss around them. Doesn't mean you gossip around them about people who aren't in the room. It does not mean that you go to the bars and get drunk with them. You never speak of Christ with them. That's not loving the children of God well. Your primary concern is not God in those relationships. If your primary concern is God, you can be sure that you're loving those children. John Calvin says this, Men are rightly and duly loved when God holds the primacy. When God holds the primacy, that's when you're loving people well. For it often happens that we love men apart from God, as unholy and carnal friendships regard only private advantages or some other vanishing object. Close quote. In other words, if you don't have God as the primary center of your relationships, you will only be treating people ultimately as objects. You're going to have a kind of what's in it for me mentality in your relationships. You've probably been in relationships like that, friendships like that. Hopefully you're not the instigator of a relationship or a friendship like that. You should confess that and turn from that if that is the case. If you do not have God at the center of your relationship, your relationship will be shallow, and dishonor to your heavenly father. And also, it will be hurtful to the other part in that relationship. We want sincere love in our relationships with others. 1 Peter 1.22 Having purified your souls by your obedience to the truth for a sincere brotherly love. In other words, because you've been born again, since you've been purified by Christ, love one another earnestly from a pure heart, from a sincere heart, an unvitiated heart for the children of God. Romans 12, 9, let love be genuine. If you do not love others for God's sake, you will fall prey to only using people for your sake. Verse 3, John goes on. For this, 
is the love of God. Do you want to know what it means to love God, what it looks like to love God? Well, here's your answer. For this is the love of God, that we keep his commandments. Beloved, love and law are complementary. Love and law keeping, love and commandment keeping, love and obedience, those are not contradictory realities. Those are complementary realities. If you love me, Jesus says, you will do what? Keep my commandments. That is where love is manifested. Just because we're saved by faith alone, which is the great battle cry of the Reformation, does not mean that we do away with the law entirely. The moral law is still very crucial to the people of God. In fact, it becomes more important in a sense to the people of God once you are born again. You love the law in a way that you never had before when you were dead in your sins and transgressions. Listen to what Paul says here about these things. Romans chapter 3, verse 31. He says, Do we then overthrow the law by this faith? Do we do away with the moral law, the Ten Commandments, and just say that doesn't exist for the believer? He says, By no means. On the contrary, we uphold the law. We uphold it even more now that we're converted. Do you love God's law as a converted child? Do you think about it all the day long like the psalmists did? Is it what you wake up craving to receive from God's word? John says in this letter, 1 John 2, 3, And by this we know that we have come to know him, if we keep his commandments. And notice what he says about the commandments there in verse 3. And his commandments are not burdensome. I love the KJV rendering of this passage. I had a buddy in Wisconsin who used to call it the KVJ. <laughs> the KJV rendering of this passage. He says, his commandments are not grievous. They don't instill grief in the heart of a man. They instill joy in the heart of the believer. They love the commandments of God. And perhaps the greatest difference between a believer and a non-believer is their response to God's law. How they view God's commandments. To not lust. To not steal. To not slander. You know, the world will tell you that God's commandments are burdensome. The world might tell you you need to sow some wild oats in your youth. And then when you get older, when life is boring, then the commandment keeping can start. The world is anything that makes God's commandments feel burdensome. But it is not burdensome. You know what is burdensome? It's not keeping God's commandments. It's breaking them. That's the true birth that the unbeliever has to bear. Romans 6, 21 says, For the end of those things is death. That's all the unbeliever reaps all the day long from their sin. Talk to the alcoholic. Talk to the one addicted to pornography. Talk to the one who's stuck in slander and what kind of relationships they have in their life. Talk to yourself when you sin. Did that sin produce fruit in my life or did it only produce death? Isaiah 57, verses 20 and 21, describing the wicked. But the wicked are like the tossing sea, for it cannot be quiet. And its waters toss up mire and dirt. There is no peace, says my God, for the wicked. Through the sin and the unbelief that the believer commits all the day long, they toss up mire and dirt in their own life and in the lives of those around them. Even in Jonah's life, if you remember his story, when he was unrepentantly running from the Lord, he tossed up mire and dirt in the lives of the sailors who almost died because of him. What will your sin cost you? But also, what will your sin cost others? Sin never comes with just a personal price tag. 
It also affects those that love us the most. But not so for you, the child of God. You love God's law. Because of God's regenerative work in your heart, you now rejoice in it and performing it and doing it. This is your heart right here. Psalm chapter 40, verse 8. I delight to do your will, O my God. Your law is within my heart. Psalm 119, 24. Your testimonies are my delight. They are my counselors. Psalm 119, 35. Lead me in the path of your commandments, for I delight in it. Psalm 119, 45. And I shall walk in a wide place, a free, spacious place like the Smoky Mountains. I will walk in a wide place where I have sought your precepts. Psalm 119, 92. If your law had not been my delight, I would have perished in my affliction. Man, when you're in a season of affliction, sometimes the only thing you can do is turn to the word. And then you realize in the end that's really all that you need. It's God in those situations. The psalmist says, if your law had not been my delight, if I wouldn't have loved your words, if I wouldn't have seen them as not burdensome, I would have perished. Have there been seasons in your life where God's word has been your only sustenance to get you through that difficult season? It was true of the psalmists here. I want to ask you a question based off of God's word, God's commandments, God's law. What are some commandments that you struggle to love? To embrace, to cherish, to keep. Is it lust, pride, murderous thoughts in your heart, slandering others? And maybe even this afternoon, go home, take out a note card, write down some of God's commands that you really struggle to delight in, and attack those things in prayer. Morning, noon, and night. That's what it takes. And God will show up. By His Holy Spirit working in and through you, He will help you to overcome. Commandment-keeping, sincerely loving faith overcomes the world. That's ingredient number two. Our third and final ingredient for a faith that overcomes the world is conquering faith. Verses four and five. Now, what do I mean by that? I mean that this faith that you have, that God has given you, It's not weak. This is a gritty, tough faith that perseveres in the face of the world. You can stare the world in its teeth with this kind of faith and say, make my day. This kind of faith, though it might put you at odds with the world, it never quits in the face of the world. Look with me at verse 4. It says, For everyone who has been born of God overcomes the world. That word overcome in the Greek is nikeo, which quite literally means to conquer. I thought about titling this morning's message, How to Conquer the World. But I thought it might be confusing to what I was trying to get across. (laughs) So we didn't title it that. But it quite literally means to conquer, to overpower, to win. To prevail, to be triumphant, to be victorious. This was used in a legal courtroom setting. When your case won out and you were proved innocent, you won that case. You nikaio that case. You conquered it. Or when an athlete would win his race, he was counted as an overcomer, a conqueror. And they would bestow the wreath upon his head to symbolize his victory. That's the kind of faith. That God has gifted to you, believer. Now notice how this is both a present and a past tense reality. Verse 4 says, For everyone who has been born of God overcomes the world. That's the, the present tense. It's happening right now. But also, John goes on, And this is the victory that has overcome the world. You both are overcoming now. And have overcome in the past. And one day when Christ returns in glory, you will overcome in the future too. You are a conqueror through and through. Your life is shot through with a kind of conquering grace that has been given you of God. 
You will win in the end. Because Christ won at Calvary. And he upholds you with that mighty right hand. Now you might be thinking to yourself, I don't really feel like a world conqueror. You know, my body's decaying. I'm stuck in sin. My family's a mess. Work is a mess. I really don't feel like a conqueror most of the time. The statement from the divines here from the Westminster Confession of Faith is particularly helpful. In chapter 13 on sanctification, talking about the battle between the flesh and the spirit, here's what they say. In this war, namely the war between the flesh and the spirit, although the remaining corruption for a time may much prevail, yet through the continual supply of strength from the sanctifying spirit of Christ, the regenerate part doth overcome. In other words, the regenerate part wins. The new man wins. The new you in Christ conquers, overcomes, is victorious. And so the saints grow in grace, perfecting in holiness the fear of the Lord. There are no dropouts in the school of grace, beloved. He will hold you fast, like the old hymn says. Romans 6, 14, for sin will have no dominion over you, since you are not under law, but under grace. So how do we battle the world here? What's something we need to remember? What will help us in this fight? Well, as you battle the world, you must remember something. That the world, with all of its boasts and everything that it could ever offer you, it pales in comparison to what is yours in Christ. And what is stored up for you in eternal glory. I want you to hear Paul here on this point from 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 21 through 23. He says, So let no one boast in men, or the things that men could boast about, or who you follow, or who, you, who your teacher is, or what your resume is like. So let no one boast in men, For all things are yours, whether Paul or Apollos or Cephas. And I just have to make a comment here on this point. (laughs) When Casey emailed me this week, at the end of his email, he closed it so pastorally. He said, yours in Christ, Casey. Amen and amen. That man is mine in Christ. I'm his. In Christ. We are mutually one of another in Christ. No matter how old you are, how young you are, what you look like, what your occupation is, you are gifts to one another in the body of Christ. You belong to each other. All things are yours in Him. Paul goes on. Or the world. In other words, he's working all things together for your good. No matter what happens in the world, it's for you because Christ has conquered the world. Or life or death. And I heard this week that death touched this community. And Paul says that even death belongs to the believer because Christ has conquered it. Death is merely the doorway to resurrection life. It's merely our entrance into eternal glory with Christ Jesus. Even death is yours. Or the present or the future, all things are yours and you are Christ and Christ is God. So don't just think about what you have, but think about whose you are. Your life is hidden with Christ and God and nothing can snatch you from his hand. The world can't offer you that. It always promises, but never delivers on its promise. God promises and delivers on his promise. But it's only for those who believe. Verse 5. Who is it that overcomes or conquers or triumphs over the world except the one who believes that Jesus is the Son of God? He puts a bow on this entire section. 
He started off by saying you have to believe that he's the Christ to be saved. And now he says you have to believe that he's the son of God to be saved. It's like saying the same thing. You have to believe in the true Jesus to be saved. If you do not overcome the world by placing your faith in Christ, the world will overcome you by getting you to place your faith in yourself. You will not conquer the world, but the world will conquer you. I don't know if you've ever read the book, The Screwtape Letters, by C.S. Lewis. It's about the devil who is advising one of his young understudy demons on how to trip up Christians. It's a wonderful book. I think C.S. Lewis went partially crazy after writing that book because it's like he was getting into the mind of a demon. But that gift is a huge blessing to the church, and I commend that book to you. Here's what C.S. Lewis says about this in loving the world and how the devil trips us up and getting us to love it. He says, Prosperity knits a man to the world. He feels that he is finding his place in it while really it is finding its place in him. His increasing reputation, his widening circle of acquaintances, his sense of importance, the growing pressure of absorbing and agreeable work, they build up in him a sense of being really at home in earth. Which is just what we want. You will notice that the young are generally less unwilling to die than the middle-aged and the old. Close quote. What he means by that is, is this. Young people typically aren't as knit to the world as someone who has a bunch of stuff as you grow in life. Therefore, they are generally less unwilling to die than those who have a lot of stuff in life. A very poignant comment by Lewis. Believer, do not let yourself become knit to this world. Prosperity will knit you to itself and it will not let you go. You must fight with holy violence by faith in this war if you are to overcome. I don't know if you follow college football either. Deion Sanders, he's coaching at Colorado now. He was at Jackson State last year. I jumped on the Jackson State bandwagon because of it. I, you know, admittedly, I did. And I followed their progress to Colorado. They're now 2-0 and now at Colorado. And this team was 1-11 last year. He totally flipped the entire roster over. 80% new players. And they're like steamrolling people. And as these players have been interviewed after their games, a common theme is something that I've noticed. They say things like, the world doubted us. The world didn't believe in us. We're proving the world wrong. We are conquering the college football landscape. We're conquering the college football world, as it were. Beloved, there is a far greater world that must be conquered. It's, it's not a military Sphere. It's not a political environment that must be conquered. There is a spiritual war that is going on around you. Do you want to conquer that world? Do you want to be a true overcomer? Well, then place your faith in the living Christ who lived and died and gave himself for you. What kind of faith overcomes the world? A Christian, loving, conquering faith is what overcomes the world. Do you possess that kind of faith? If not, I pray that God gives you no sleep until you do. But if you do, pray that God increases that faith so that you might enjoy this blessed conquest all the more your good and for his glory. Father in heaven, we pray now that you would 
Increase our faith. Give us faith if we don't have it yet. God, give us that kind of conquering, overcoming, triumphant faith in Christ if we are not possessors of it at this point. But God, we pray for an increase of our faith so that we might indeed enjoy this conquest that has been wrought for us in King Jesus. God, help us to be overcomers. Help us to be great lovers of you and of people. Help us to be Christ confessors who share our faith with others so that they might overcome in him as well. And it is only by the help of your Holy Spirit that we will grow in this endeavor. So we pray that you would fill us, that you would increase our faith, that you would grow us in grace, that you would encourage us that we are more than conquerors through him who loved us, Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray these things.